when the CDA was being created, the county board by statute had some options in terms of what the size of the, the compilation of the CDA could board, board could be, um, what does it look like, is it all, in many counties, they are entirely county board members. And um, to the credit of the board at that time, they said, no, 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 if this is gonna be effective, it needs to be driven by community, right? And so by statute, there are a couple board members on there that have to be, but they said, make it as big as it can be and make it as diverse as can be with community members, because that's gonna, it's gonna make it effective long-term. And so thank you to Jeff, thank you to the other CDA members who, who, who dedicate their time and have been really, really instrumental in this plan. This is not, for all intents and purposes, this is not, well, the county created it. This is, this is the CDA's plan. Occasionally the county board has to do this, right? But for the most part, this has been driven and by the CDA. So thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Val and Elaine. Um, in 2019, we did a, a visitor profile study and one of, we asked visitors that come to Ottertail County, what do you like about this county? What, 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 what do you, and they had to rank them. Our small, charming communities were at the top of the list and these are two of the best, um, I, I love all of our charming small 22 <laughs> communities, but Battle Lake and Ottertail do a great job thanks to people like Elaine and uh, Val. I was distracted for a second. I'm supposed to be moving us into the next section. So the very, what we're doing next, Amy and Barbara are sticking around. Tanya Westra from the HRA is also going to be joining us. Um, it's great that we can build a culture and a community where we are encouraging development, we're encouraging housing, but sometimes you also, also have to put your money where your mouth is, right Amy? So right now they're gonna talk about big, big exciting news, is that, is that true? Money, they've got baskets of money waiting in back th that everybody's gonna get. It's the reverse of church, right? Um, so, so they're gonna talk about it. I'll turn it back over to Amy, Tanya, and Barbara. All right, I think we're on now. We got replacement batteries, so Tanya's mic'd up. We're, we're ready to go. And, yeah, I don't know if we have, hold it close to my mouth, okay. Um, I don't know that we have baskets of money, Nick, but, um, but close, close. Uh, we do have a lot of new resources and we're really excited to, to talk about these new funds um, that we have available, again, to help make these projects happen. Um, we've been able to partner with some limited resources over the last couple of years, um, but we do um, now have new programs and new ways that we can be a part of um, making, again, making projects happen, making, um, creating new homes, keeping people in, in quality homes. And uh, so we will talk about that. Um, so, um, but to, um, yeah, we wanna be your partner, okay. <laughs> um, so we'll give a background um, kind of to how, a little bit more about, you know, we've, we've heard, you know, we established, uh, the county established the CDA to really advance the housing. Uh, but there's also some other initiatives happening within the county to really create um, the uh, vision for what the county uh, wants to see. So the Long Range Strategic Plan of Otter Tail County was approved in December of 2020, so uh, just over a year ago. And the goal of that plan is to develop a vision and the goals for the future of Otter Tail County that can be used as a tool to guide uh, future decision making. And uh, there's a lot of uh, components, it's a large document, it's a large plan, covers a whole spectrum of areas from uh, certainly the economy, but also land use, uh, natural resources, our uh, transportation infrastructure systems, uh, et cetera. But two specific goals in that plan uh, talk about housing. And one is um, just the broad goal of we need to look towards providing opportunities for a variety of housing types throughout the county and the second being uh, the need to promote the development of a range of housing options that meet the needs of all affordability levels. And we um, you know, look across our spectrum and making sure that um, people have access to housing that fits their, um, their um, needs, their financial needs, and, um, but that there is that range and that uh, spectrum of opportunity. Uh, so you know, with those guiding principles and, and um, as a result of the pandemic, Otter Tail County uh, was, um, uh, received an allocation of federal dollars through the American Rescue Plan 
and uh, the board looked at priority areas that um, could be supported through those funds that also aligned with that long-range strategic plan. So within there, there's four areas um, of a, a framework of investment that the county board has approved for those $11.4 million um, from the federal government. And uh, the first is housing, which we'll talk more about today, uh, business and workforce, broadband and infrastructure, and then community resilience. So as um, in the next few years, as those funds are um, deployed and invested into the communities, um, there was really an intention to be aligned with that um, the vision within the long range strategic plan. And just one final note on the um, on those the federal funds, these one time dollars that the county has available. It was really thought um, really thoughtful from the county board's perspective about investing those dollars not just spending these one-time dollars, but investing so that the dollars will have a lasting impact throughout the county um, in those areas that I mentioned. So that brings us to how do we fund these new programs? We know um, overall financing and financial situations are tight, but again, the county was um, able to leverage these one-time dollars uh, from uh, the American Rescue Plan and think about how can we leverage those dollars um, to expand housing opportunity and investment. So um, with this unique opportunity, uh, we, um, the county board, um, based on some, um, the programs that we'll be talking about in, in recommendation, um, has approved um, $2 million to support um, these programs and really kickstart and, and um, ramp up some investment in housing. Uh, with the, um, well, I think that's, we'll stop there. We'll get more into the programs in a little bit. Um, but I'll turn it over to Barbara to talk about another funding stream that we're um, launching uh, in, in um, collaboration with that $2 million that the county board has set aside. Thank you, Amy. Uh, the Housing Trust Fund is a new tool that was created by the county board uh, last July. And uh, what is unique about this uh, fund is that not only can it hold uh, public contributions allocations from communities or uh, the county, but also take in private donations. Uh, for example, employer contributions or a grant from uh, a foundation. Um, so in general, the, the total impact of this is that it stretches our capacity uh, to uh, create additional units and uh, preserve the units that we have. So, with these two sources of uh, public investment, um, this is the opportunity to partner with you on the private investment. So, we want to make a dent in uh, the shortage of housing in the county. Um, so, we have created uh, two strategic initiatives. Um, simply create new homes and to uh, keep people in their homes. And the initial allocation is a 75-25 split of the two and a half million with creating new homes being uh, allocated toward the construction of new rental and owner-occupied housing workforce and affordable and um, to help folks stay in quality homes is a rehab uh, program for both owner-occupied and uh, rental housing. The guiding principles that we are going to administer these funds are uh, fivefold. First, um, we're going to take in the application and then we'll decide which, uh, uh, which source of funding is, uh, the, uh, is the best match so that you don't have to figure that out. Um, second, um, we are asking uh, developers or builders to go to uh, the communities where the development is going to be located in and get a resolution of support. Again, with that uh, county-city partnership, we want to make sure that it is uh, supported by the community. Um, and also, um, there is an expectation of some type of local contribution, and that can take um, a number of forms, and we will talk about that later. Um, third, um, the uh, amount of uh, funding um, will uh, provided to the project will depend on the level of uh, affordability that's uh, proposed uh, or the financing structure of the development. 
And then finally, um, the, the funding, uh, there will be a funding agreement, uh, development agreement uh, prepared for uh, each development to outline the amount of assistance. And as Val talked about earlier, uh, the county will do this and the developer and, uh, and builder has uh, a responsibility to do this. So, so everybody's um, on the same page. Uh, Amy, uh, now we're going, am I on the right slide? I'm way ahead, okay. <laughs> Sarah will make sure we're on the right slide. So. Thank you, Sarah. All right, so the, um, as you know, over the last two years, I've had a lot of conversations with cities, with developers, uh, with folks involved in, in the development world, and that also helped inform um, how these programs were developed and the gap that they'll fill. Um, you know, we're not looking to um, be a lead in a financing role necessarily, but how do we figure out um, how to get a project to move forward. So what is the gap, what's the need? And one of the areas that continually comes up is infrastructure. And you know, how do we get, you know, we certainly wanna make good use of existing infrastructure because that's always the, the, the easiest way if there's sewers and, sewer and water capacity, roads built, we wanna get housing built there. But in some of our communities, they really do need to extend that infrastructure and that can be prohibitive. So um, this one, uh, the first program is for public infrastructure. And um, again, this application would come from the city. So similar to some of the programs that uh, Val talked about previously, we do look for the, the city to be the applicant um, for this particular pro program because it is public infrastructure. Um, certainly needs to be supported with a, a very um, uh, a, a development opportunity. It's not for speculative infrastructure, so not just because, well, we wanna build a road somewhere. That's, that isn't the intent of this program. It's we have this development opportunity. We have a, a need to get the, um, the infrastructure there, um, but we can't put together all the funding sources to make it happen and still be a, a viable project. Um, it, it does need to be within the city um, or, or if it, there could be an annexation situation, I suppose. Uh, the funds can provide up to 50% of the per unit cost for that infrastructure. So, um, but then a maximum of $100,000 um, towards a development. So kind of those two thresholds in, in determining the amount that might be available for a project. Um, and as has mentioned, we will uh, look for specific terms um, and, and um, obligations or you know, expectations of what's going to happen as far as the housing project um, or what the, the city would be doing um, to get this project moving within a, a funding agreement. So making sure that there's um, some certainty and clarity about what's expected, what's going to happen, and then what happens if it doesn't go as expected. Um, sometimes that does happen, um, but uh, our policymakers really wanted to emphasize this is to, to help be that last push to get a project out of the ground or, or into, the, um, into construction. So, um, and also having a match, as, as has been mentioned, we wanna leverage these dollars, looking for a minimum of a one-to-one. -one. We know how large uh, infrastructure projects can get. So this isn't, again, this isn't meant to be the primary financing structure, um, but, uh, in a, and not a substitute to existing or traditional financing uh, for infrastructure, but to really be um, a support in making a project able to move forward and, and get it to a go, uh, go ahead, so. Um, the infrastructure pieces that we'd be looking at, again, are sewer, water, uh, roads, um, storm water, um, and sidewalks if they're um, within the project itself. So that is program number one. Okay, program number two is for new construction for owner-occupied uh, a value gap. And uh, just a heads up, at our 1230 session, um, we'll be going through um, the details of the outcome of the housing needs analysis, which the bottom line is there's strong demand uh, for this type of product as well as the others that we are going to be um, hoping to help finance. So as I mentioned earlier this morning, uh, value gap is the difference between the construction cost per unit and the anticipated sales price. So in this uh, a program, we uh, would like to fund up to 50000 uh, uh, per unit um, and for eligible uh, buyers uh, up to 115% area median income. 
which at this point um, is approximately 107,000 for um, a household of uh, four. Um, and then uh, what we would expect in the application is um, the information uh, to demonstrate that um, indeed the costs are X and the anticipated sale price is Y and here is the, uh, and here is the request for, uh, for the value gap. Um, we are uh, wanting to see uh, local contributions equal to one-to-one -one match of uh, county funding. Uh, so, uh, go ahead. Oh, I, Barbara, if I could add just sure. one piece and kind of the why this program, I mean, this is, um, it, as we looked back in the last few years of what was getting built for single family homes within the county, it was really that higher tier, that three fifty dollars um, to $400,000 home or more is what was getting built. Mm -hmm. And so as we saw, as we look at that continuum of our housing infrastructure, our housing supply, that we are going to have a gap. There was a gap of entry level, um, smaller uh, homes in our markets. And because of that challenge that, that Barbara described where you know, the cost to build that exceeds what uh, someone can obtain a mortgage for, what it's able to sell for um, in the marketplace. And those buyers who are coming in are often the first time home buyers wouldn't be selling a home that they're you know, gaining a lot of equity on, that they're able to put into the new home, which is what a lot of what's happening today, why people have been able to um, overcome that with those higher priced single family homes. So we really recognize this as a gap and a, a challenge for our workforce. You, know, you mentioned the, the income, you know, $107,000 for a, a family of four, it would be the, the current income. Um, those will be updated um, likely this month yet for this next calendar year. And that's really our, our workforce, um, uh, core worker, especially our younger families uh, coming into the marketplace. So just wanted to add that kind of context to why this program is so important to get the, those homes built in our communities and support our, our first time or, or newer home buyers. Uh, Tanya will now talk about uh, the down payment assistance program. Good morning. The down payment assistance program will serve households whose income does not exceed 115% of the area median income or the TIP guidelines and uh, will use the guidelines uh, that are higher. Participants do not need to be a first time home buyer to access this program. And this is a 0% interest deferred loan for up to 5% of the purchase price. The maximum loan is $10,000 per household. And these funds can be paired with developments that utilize value gap and infrastructure financing. I think to add one more piece to that, Tanya, too, that we know a number of our communities have down payment assistance programs or opportunities. And what we'd want to do with this program is to uh, match that. So if, if you had a local program, we'd want to you know, make sure our funds are, are being used to help you preserve your dollars to help further support um, uh, the uh, down payment assistance for additional buyers, but make sure you know, that we're, we're helping those and, and working together on those programs. The next program is a uh, rental gap financing loan. Uh, this is a new type of a deferred loan um, in the county, and the intent is to fill a gap in the capital sources uh, in order to construct a rental development. So we will consider a greater allocation if the development is serving uh, lower income households. Uh, in general, um, the maximum should be at 80% uh, AMI. Um, and um, there will be a uh, requirement that the rents um, and incomes uh, need to be self-certified by uh, the tenants. But if there are other funding sources uh, in, the, in the project that require um, some type of uh, a management cer uh, a certification, we will certainly um, uh, accept that. And now we are going to move into the rehab programs. Tanya. Okay. The owner-occupied rehabilitation program will serve households that do not exceed 80% of the area median income as established by HUD. And as noted earlier, we're awaiting new income limits to be published here any day. 
50% of the borrowed funds are in the form of a deferred loan that is forgiven after five years, and the remaining portion must be repaid at the time of sale of the property or refinance of a mortgage. The maximum loan limit is $30,000 if a local leverage source contributes to the project. If no lo local leverage is contributed, then $20,000 would be the maximum per household. And this program is eligible for buildings that contain one to four owner occupied units. So if it's a twin home, um, a triplex where all the units are owner occupied, as long as all of those owners are eligible, we would consider doing a project at that home. Tony, do you want to talk a little bit about how Sorry. this pairs with um, the small cities development fund from the state of Minnesota? Yeah, so if your community has reuse funds, um, as long as the applicant household meets the criteria for the small cities reuse and this program, the small cities reuse funds could be used as that local leverage. So I think if you have program income or local income through small cities in your community, if you would let me know and let me know what your balance is because as applications come in, I can kind of monitor which communities have those funds available and then we can use those as that local contribution. Okay, the last program that I will talk about is the rental rehabilitation loan. And it is, of course, a loan that is repaid over 10 years at 2% interest. Building owners um, do need to contribute to this project, and it will be a minimum of 25% of the total project cost. The loan limits for this program are $20,000 for a single family rental unit and $12,500 per unit in buildings that consist of two to eight rental units. In buildings where nine or more rental units exist, the maximum loan is $100,000. Uh, rent restrictions will be in place for the duration of the loan, and those do get updated annually. We are using the um, MHFA table. Those rent restrictions are, uh, I think, quite generous. Uh, it shouldn't really be an issue. So. And Tanya, as I recall, um, sometimes um, owners are able to um, remodel to the point where they're creating additional rental units. Is that uh, eligible under this uh, program? Yes. Yeah, we, we can create new units. Um, we might have to do a mix of funding between the two programs, between rehab and new construction. Uh, it is definitely an option. So if that is something you know, that interests you, and it's not just creating additional units within your building. If you have um, commercial space that you want to convert to rental units, anything like that, we can certainly talk about that and entertain that. Yeah, I think that's a good point. That's something we've also uh, helped our communities look at, you know, with construction costs being as high as they are, how can we utilize maybe spaces that were traditionally um, designed for something else and, and aren't being occupied or, or utilized? So that's another way we can partner um, and we'll talk a little bit more about our other funding streams that can potentially help with that as well. Um, but we do want to make sure we're, we're activating as much space as we can. Um, and if it doesn't make sense to keep it um, into whatever that current use is, that we want to help be a partner in rehabbing and converting that to housing as well. So now, okay, so we overviewed those. We'll have time for questions. We know we, we put a lot out there. We, can, uh, we, we are expecting questions for clarification, uh, more information, et cetera. So we wanna, we'll, we'll leave plenty of time for that. But wanna walk through the application process itself. What will this look like? How, how will a project um, get its funding um, at the end of the day? So um, step one, you know, the applicant, uh, again, can either be the city or uh, the developer, depending on which program it's going into or the, or the property owner, if it's a, a rehab, um, situation. If it is new construction, as mentioned, we do want the city to express their support for the project. We certainly don't want to be participating in a project that isn't aligned with a community's plans uh, or goals. 
So you know, really the first step is to meet with us as staff and, and talk through that project, um, identify you know, where, what is the funding stream. Maybe it isn't one of ours. Maybe it's helping identify you know, one of the sources um, that Val talked about and uh, that they were, have been able to access or another program. We really want to help leverage um, our dollars but also bring in outside dollars to, to make housing happen. So that's kind of the first step. What's the project? What's the idea? Um, and if it, how it layers into our programs, um, we would have a, an application that gets looked at. Um, if it does need a board approval, it would need to be submitted at least a month before, so we have plenty of time, particularly for um, you know, the, the bigger requests, the bigger applications, so that we can ensure that, that the funds are needed. We have to make sure we're preserving our, our dollars. Uh, we do want to get them out the door, but we also have to make sure that, that the funds are needed to make a project move forward. And then our job um, uh, at the county is to you know, certainly accept that application, review it, make sure it, it does make sense, again, align with the funding stream that, that makes um, the most sense within the project. And then depending on the dollar amount, there could be an administrative approval by staff, or it would need to go to um, uh, the board for approval on that. And by board, it's either the, the CDA or HRA board um, that we would envision um, needing to take a, an approval action on that. And then we continue to work together. Um, we developed that agreement that was talked about, and we'll have some standard documents that will be used. We won't be preparing new documents for every project, um, but there might be terms that get tweaked based on the, the situation and the details of that project, and then hopefully move towards construction and, um, and get uh, the funds distributed and depending on how the project um, is structured, if the funds are revolving, that is a goal from our policymakers as well, is that depending on how the funds are needed in the project, can they come back so that we can uh, use them again and revolve those dollars? But we recognize in a number of cases, as we've described, they are going to need to go in as grants and um, be you know, one-time dollars used in that way. So that would be the application process, and we'll really have a, a pipeline process, but then a monthly review uh, for those that need to go to the board um, for specific approval. All right, and, and we've made reference to some of these projects uh, or pro other programs that we already have, the existing um, grants that the Community Development Agency has. Uh, Val mentioned them, uh, Elaine as well. Uh, we've also worked in other or provided funds in Vergas, New York Mills, uh, Dalton. Um, i sure I'm forgetting somebody, <laughs> but uh, we I do have um, what we call community growth partnership grants, and they've been around for uh, just over two years at the CDA, and it uh, supports three primary areas, uh, affordable housing, redevelopment, and then commercial rehabilitation. Um, and then we have a planning grant as well that I mentioned earlier that um, can be up to $5,000. Uh, the other projects um, for redevelopment can be up to $25,000. Um, and a community can apply for a maximum of, of multiple projects, but a maximum each year up to $50,000. So we've um, been involved in uh, rehabbing childcare in New York Mills. Um, I think that's the one I missed there. Um, also um, help them set up a, a down payment assistance program uh, in New York Mills. We've done a number of planning studies um, in a, a few communities. And then the redevelopment um, that we mentioned with um, Battle Lake and Vergus, and as well as um, a rehab in Otter Tail as well. So those um, applications also are reviewed monthly. So if you have uh, an idea or an opportunity, again, we would review it just kind of in a streamlined process. And these could be layered with the programs that we just talked about as well, if there's a need within the project. So again, we'll help identify. You don't need to worry about all the details. Um, just say, hey, does this, does this work within the program? We have this project. It can't quite get off the ground. How, can, how could the, the county be a part of it? Some of the other programs that the Otter Tail County Housing Authority offers are similar in nature to what you have heard about today with owner-occupied rehab and rental rehab. Uh, there are little differences with income limits or loan limits, um, things of that nature. But we do offer a down payment assistance program, uh, an emergency home repair program. 
that loan fund is limited more to, again, emergencies. Um, a well that's going dry, windows that are rotting, a roof that is leaking or about to leak, things of that nature. Whereas the owner-occupied loan program through big build funds um, is a little more all-encompassing. We'll cover more things. We also offer an affordable rental unit construction program. So. Um, and a rental unit rehab loan fund. So again, if you have a project or an idea, uh, please reach out to us. Um, we can see where it fits and talk through the, the specifics and get going. Great, I think the one final slide, and I'm gonna stand up for this one. So we've talked a lot about these incomes and we know that's a lot of, a lot of numbers, some acronyms that we threw out with that. Um, but wanted to just kind of highlight, um, you know, Barbara mentioned the 60% of our area median income and what that means. Um, so it's, you know, 35,000 for a household of two, um, uh, almost 45,000 for a household of uh, four or more. And just to give reference, the median income of our renters, and that's the 60% the, um, is for our rental programs. Uh, currently the median income of renters in Otter Tail County is $31,000. So it is the market for renters. So just to, to put that out there to get that context of if that seems like scary numbers or, or uncertainty or just, you know, we don't always know those numbers, but, but that is the current median income um, for, for our county. So just wanted to highlight that one. And then the, the bottom line um, of that 115% of the state's um, median income is what we use, what we're, uh, we'll be using for the ownership side. So that's the the 107 that was referenced earlier. Um, so just wanted to give a little little bit on that one um, for that. So other things. is it time for the pop quiz now? It's time for the pop quiz from you guys. So we have no no idea what the questions are coming. So that's a, a good pop quiz. Maybe I'll give Nick a microphone and I hope there's questions. Who has questions? Thank you. So just to confirm, all of everything you just presented, those are new programs supported by the 2.5 ARP dollars. Is that correct? Uh, thanks for that question. So uh, 500,000, I'll start with the kind of the side, is the new housing trust fund. Those are levy funded um, at this point. And then you know, can take the other funds that Barbara talked about you know, from foundations, private, um, community-based, so that's to build that, preserve that trust fund. Uh, the $2 million um, that we are looking at uh, from American Rescue Plan, um, some may come from, and I, <laughs> I know you're from Senator Smith's office, so uh, the, uh, I know, I'm being very <laughs> careful, very careful, Nick. Um, it's not a gotcha. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. <laughs> So we certainly we have affordability on everything but the um, infrastructure. Um, I did mention roads, which we know are not. Um, so uh, we are looking at offsetting um, some other resources with American Rescue Plan eligible funds. And uh, so that we can just have more of that comprehensive piece. And then as well, the revolving portion we know is not uh, aligned well with American Rescue Plan uh, guidelines. And we do want to revolve these dollars when it's appropriate. So again, we may look to offset those dollars in other ways, but it's really funds made available because we have that resource um, through the American Rescue Plan. Sure, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And then one additional follow-up. So with this 2.5, can you put a number, can you estimate how many units mm -hmm. that will support for the construction or rehab? Yeah, we have done that number. Um, I don't have it with me today, but we um, have, we don't know where the demand is fully going to fall. You know, we did the 25%, 75% for rehab and new construction. Um, and so we did estimate some numbers on a range of numbers um, with some assumed demand based on somewhat conversations we've had with communities where we know there's some projects coming and what that will leverage. I mean, it might be, it really depends on the, if the infrastructure is serving a 10 unit single family or a 40 unit apartment building there's a pretty big variable in that, but we, we do have some estimates on that and we can sure get those to you. 
Thank you so much. Um, this might be a really stupid question, but I can't answer it in my brain, so I'm going to ask the smart people in the room. So the housing trust fund, the $500,000, can it, if, if more than that is contributed, could, right, if, if I'm a philanthropist or if I'm a business or if I'm a whatever and I want to add to that housing trust fund, it could be more than 500000 right? Absolutely. Yes, please. Okay, and then and then and then and then my follow up is there is there any fine, other than the greater good is there any financial incentive for me as a business or a philanthropist or as whatever do I get a deduction from other some other sheet of paper or is there any other benefits to me to contributing to the trust fund? Uh, I'm going to respond with two uh, answers. Uh, first, if you're a business, odds are you're trying to attract uh, good employees and the return on your investment is going to be new housing to attract uh, the younger age uh, folks. And then secondly, um, so that seniors that are in their homes now and that want to move, if they move to a different uh, home that's just constructed, that creates the churn in the marketplace so that the entry folks can, uh, can enter into home ownership. So uh, hiring employees, Creating housing um, is uh, the benefit. The other benefit, too, is we're hoping to expand the tax base on this as well. Um, the second part of the answer I was thinking about is that if you are a private entity, I would talk to your CPA uh, to see if that is deductible on your income uh, the taxes. I am not that smart. <laughs> other questions? I'll just piggyback to kind of follow up on Eric's, you know, it could, could it be more? Yes. And, and all of these programs are looking for leverage dollars. So it's not that we'll be putting 50,000 in, in itself. I mean, there'll be other funds uh, to generate um, um, impact uh, within these projects. So, so all the funds will be leveraged. So the total um, investment beyond even just the development um, costs, you know, to, you know, fill the gap, you know, we're looking for leverage dollars even with that gap filling. How long I, has the CPA been organized? Sure, so uh, was it officially January of 2019? I'm looking to Nick, 20... Oh, sorry, the question was how long has the CDA been organized? And uh, I came on board in March of 2019 and I think the official organizing work happened in January of that year. I, I stopped thinking about this the yes. moment Amy came on board, but I, I believe that sounds right. <laughs> Any of the CDA members remember? Is that? I'm pretty sure that's right. It's been so fun for them; they, it's hard to keep track. Yeah, yeah. So some of the background is uh, you, you were you were there for that, and I went to. That didn't mean I wanted the microphone, however. Um, so, so for a little background on the CDA, um, oh, I'm sorry, for a little background on how the CDA became, so back in 2012, and there's a few people on the CDA that were involved in those meetings also, the county board um, asked of local business leaders that they come in and meet with us unofficially, so to speak, uh, sat down and had lunch and said, okay. How do we grow the county? How do we grow the economy of the county? How do we do those kinds of things? Really, that was the root, uh, in my mind, of how this all began. So this, this was a vision of the county board at the time. We invited local business leaders in. Jeff, I don't know, I think you were involved. Um, Mr. Ripley was involved, I know. I think Mr. Sharnak was involved. Members that are still on the, on the CDA serving our communities today. And so it really became, and started as an initiative of the county board saying, okay, we need to grow our tax base. We need to get housing. We recognize we needed housing then. And so from that, it developed. And then in 20, probably 18, then we started looking at, okay, what mechanisms can we use? Well, and what was determined was is we could use the HRA 
to turn and make that into a community development agency and use some of the funding and those kinds of things. And so the CDA officially started about in January 1 of 2019, but it's really been kind of developed over seven years until we got there. So um, it, it, as, as friends of mine say, um, turning the Queen Mary takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. This has been a long concerted effort and I think we're just beginning to see the fruits of that, so. Thanks for reminding us about that background. Other questions? So the question is, what role does the development authority play in this with, within the CDA, and right. does the county have a development authority? So do you want to answer that complex sure. question? Sure. It, I, I think it's an easy answer. So actually, the Community Development Agency is the Economic Development Authority, uh, but we ha also have uh, powers through the housing and redevelopment uh, statutes with the state of Minnesota. So combined, we refer to it as the Community Development Agency. Is that... So we're all one in the same. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. I don't see any other hands. Really? Come on. <laughs> we want hard questions. We're here. We're ready. Otherwise, we certainly are available all day today um, to take questions, uh, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, talk about opportunities, talk more specifically about the process, what that will look like, and. Um, and, and be around. So we are we are here all day as well. Latham, do you have a question? Good. All right. <laughs> Maybe for the next session you'll have a question. <laughs> Rudy's got a question. I have a question. Uh, I moved back to the area about four years ago. This is the first time I hear about this great projects happening. Um, I represent a very large large diversity in the Pelican Rapids area. Um, my question is one, how do current residents access these programs? And two, how do we give them the resources to make sure that they follow all the steps? Because I can tell you that your everyday person is not going to have the time and resources to go through the entire application process and all the demands. So how do we provide resources to them? And also, how do we go across through different language and different demographic channels? Yeah, great. I'll talk about the marketing and promotion of the opportunities, and then I'll maybe turn it to Tanya for <laughs> the application side. Um, so, you know, these are new. There's been some new things coming from, or some of the existing programs from the HRA that have been around, but we're also ramping those up um, as we speak. So this is new, so we haven't done a lot of promotion. Um, so we'll be kicking off the promotion now for the down payment assistance. Um, you know, the rehab opportunities, you know, particularly more the resident driven applications. And I think that's where you're coming from, Rudy, uh, that we'll be promoting that out. We as a county, so kind of to give this global perspective, we also are looking at how can we do better about translating our materials, um, having those resources in multiple languages, um, even if it's in the promotional side and then, then provide the assistance in filling out the applications um, through our, our language services. So we are looking at that and we'll make sure we promote um, as we're, especially again, the resident, resident driven um, opportunities that we're getting those out. A component we didn't talk about today also is around housing navigation. So becoming um, at the county and the HRA, being a resource for folks who are seeking housing and um, are you know, struggling to find appropriate housing or, or safe and secure housing, that we can um, either work with one of our, our, our great partners or provide that, you know, more, be more of that single point to refer people out to resources. That's a, an additional um, component we're growing with this effort as well. So owner, owner occupied rehab and the down payment assistance program, that application process um, is, I would say, much easier to navigate than um, some of the other programs. The information that is needed, you know, um, for down payment assistance, somebody would have already provided to their bank, 
So it would, in essence, be more readily accessible. Um, if somebody needs help with an application form, they can certainly contact me. I'll be more than willing to help them. And likewise, if you see a, a need in your community uh, that, we're, that I'm missing or we're just not recognizing, please call us and let us know um, so we can work that problem together and figure out how do we get these programs to the people that could use them, access them, and need them. I would say just keep in mind that I think a community liaison would be phenomenal to make sure that you cross those barriers. Uh, to have an access point where people come to resources, a single point office where they go in and know all those resources are available and then have guidance through the multiple steps. Yeah, that's really appreciated, Rudy. Thank you. Any other questions? All the way to the back. Marie wanted me to get my steps in. <laughs> um, I know that, you know, looking at developing an area or building a house um, is a really daunting task and it's, it's almost overwhelming and you just don't even know where to begin, you know, and I've heard um, that this process, you have to apply for the application before you break ground. Is that correct? Yeah, for the um, single family property tax rebate, you would apply before you start construction and you have a, do have a year to start construction after application. So okay. um, earlier is better and we don't need a lot of detail um, when that application comes in other than most importantly, the location is not, you know, if you have that location, you're good to apply. Okay, and then if, in your opinion, what is the, the very first thing you should do if you're going to build a single family home, you know, what is the first thing you should do before you do anything else? That's a big question, Marie. <laughs> <laughs> There's reasons why I've never built a house and that's because I don't know the answer. Um, my husband keeps telling me we should, but I'm, we're not. Uh, it's, well, I mean, I think it depends. I think it, it depends on, you know, if you have, some people find their dream lot and, and their location and know where they want to be, and that's their starting point, but really developing that relationship with the builder, understanding the resources, you know, particularly today, you know, with, you know, how can you make the whole structure work? So, yeah, and, and lenders are great resources on that as well. I was going to add to that, um, in New York Mills, come to the city office to get your building permit and we will give you the list of resources to head to to find out about their tax rebate program. If those, the lot you're looking at falls into that, we'll tell you about our down payment assistance program. We'll shoot you over to the county if we think they've got something. So your, your city offices are really a great resource if you're going to be building inside of city limits. Great. Thanks, Julie. Yes, there's, there are a lot of resources out there and just start asking, um, you know, around too, you know, whether it's your builder, the lumber yard, the, um, the city itself, uh, the, you know, we're happy to help as well. Okay, your opportunity for questions is now over because we, I have a, I have a, you had 15 minutes for a break, you're down to seven or eight, right? No, no, no. 25. We can take another question. Oh. I, I lied. You've got plenty of time. More questions. It's open. Or. Uh, thanks for the information. This is really good. And I realize this question is interfering with a, a bathroom break, but we'll ask it anyway. Um, you know, Eric, I think, mentioned the workforce piece. And, and I'm not sure if housing feeds workforce or workforce feeds housing, but in light of you know everything that if everyone's an employer in here they're facing either historic turnover or uh, historic vacancies and time to fill um, so i know amy we've talked about some other initiatives that maybe complement this that you're working on to have creative solutions to get people into the workforce can you maybe speak to that sure yeah thanks kent uh, 
So uh, I'll give one just piece of, you know, is it a chicken or egg? Just one comment is in what you'll hear later from, from Barbara, I'll steal a little bit of her thunder, but um, not surprising, our vacancy rates are extremely low in our rental. Our for sale inventory are extremely low. There just is not housing available. So that would, and we know when we see housing get built, you know, I looked at our, our representatives from Perham area here and, and, and many of our communities, if it gets built, it gets filled. And so it's just how do we figure out how to get it built and not saying that's, that's I'm not saying, not making any <laughs> um, statements that you should build and affirming it's going to get filled. So don't, don't take that too literally. Um, but that's the experience that has been, um, that we've realized. So, and, and Eric, you know, leads our charge on um, putting Ottertail County on the map. Um, but we also know that we need to leverage and, and support all of our, our individuals here from a workforce perspective, whether we're engaging our youth in workforce navigation in a different way, which we've kicked off a, a several months ago. We're looking at how do we um, leverage those who are underemployed or unemployed today, which we know there aren't a lot of them, but who is out there? Is it a skills gap? What barrier are they facing? And help folks overcome those barriers if it's transportation or stable housing, or child care, that we're helping um, individuals um, get into the workforce and more productively in the workforce um, through, again, training or um, additional kind of wraparound um, supports and coaching and um, relationships. So um, yeah, it's called OTC Works. And again, we will be hopefully having an event um, <laughs> later this year that really drills into some of those opportunities. Um, there's a lot of great resources on you know, second chance individuals and, and getting people, again, who might not be as productive in the workforce, um, productive in the workforce. Any more questions since we have time? <laughs> All right, round of applause for our panel.